Good evening. Thanks um, for coming this evening. It's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Chase, a former journalist. Um, I guess many people here tonight are journalists, and she's um, a rare former journalist who got fed up with reporting on the plight of people in Afghanistan and decided to actually do something about it. Sarah runs um, a women's cooperative in Kandahar, which um, is for Hamid Karzai's brother, Qayyum. Not anymore. Not okay, well, you can explain that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and they make soaps and other products, and it's aimed at finding an alternative for people um, to poppy. And she also launched the most popular radio station in southern Afghanistan. Unlike most foreigners who live in Afghanistan, who live behind high walls and hescos, she actually lives among the people of Kandahar and sees a very different kind of life than most foreigners do see. And yet, back in 2001, Sarah was Paris reporter for National Public Radio, sending back reports, it says here, on the mad cow crisis <laughs> and how bakeries were morphing into fast food joints. And when September 11th um, happened, she called her office and said, what can I do? And found herself in Quetta and um, found herself covering real wars instead of food wars. So welcome to the front line this evening, Sarah. And I think probably to start with, many of us here would like to know what it was that made you switch from being a journalist to running a cooperative. I, I think um, it, I was troubled by issues even before September 11th that I suspect trouble journalists on and off um, you know, throughout their careers, which had to do with, I guess, two points in particular. One, had to, one is direct impact. It feels very indirect in spite of the legendary, you know, uh, effect that journalism can have on, on public affairs. It can feel very indirect. And secondly, the kind of um, lack of continuity. You know, you, you get parachuted, um, as you know, you know into places, you become connected with those places, with the people, with the story, and then you are yanked out and there's some other story. Um, and those two things were troubling me, I think. Um, and food stories in Paris, as delightful as that may sound, definitely didn't feel like um, where things were happening. It's not that I had a premonition or anything like that that 9-11 was going to happen, but it certainly felt as though the world was in a delicate place uh, in the summer of, ni uh, of 2001. And Paris was not, you know, didn't have to do with whatever was going wrong. You live now in Kandahar, which is one of the most conservative cities in Afghanistan. What is it like living there as a Westerner? I mean, I've reported from there, and I know that it is a difficult place to to go to. How, how do you actually live there? Can you tell us a bit about your life, where you live? I live, And also, you yeah. must tell us about Mullah Omar's cow. Mullah Omar's cow. Well, there are actually two stages to my post um, post reporting career, which got a little bit uh, collapsed in your description. At first, the way I actually ended up staying behind. Um, so I, 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 in answer to your previous question, I sort of um, gave the general feeling. But the specific was that I had dinner on my way out of, uh, out of the region with President Karzai's uncle, who had been one of my background sources and a very incisive guy. And we had this long discussion about what challenges Afghanistan would be facing and this and that. And this is a Karzai family trait. You know, you get to the door and they pop the question. And the question was wouldn't you come back and help us? And I said yes before I had even registered the question. Um, and so indeed, what, what ended up happening first, I kind of flailed around for a while trying to figure out, well, how am I going to come back and help? In what guise? Um, and I approached some of the big you know, aid agencies or donor agencies, um, 
with a very specific idea in mind, which had to do with anti-corruption. It had to do with um, being a sort of corruption prevention officer in terms of how international assistance would be delivered and to whom it would be delivered. And nobody was really interested um, in that. They didn't have it on their organograms yet and uh, still don't, as far as I can tell. Um, and so I call Uncle Aziz again, who by this time has been made ambassador plenipotentiary in um, Prague or something like that. And he says, oh, well, I've got another nephew, um, Hamid's older brother, and he's got this uh, NGO. Why don't you go work for him? So I call up Kayum Karzai, who's President Karzai's older brother, and sight unseen on the telephone, <laughs> you know, he says, oh, yeah, you should run my NGO. It doesn't exist yet, but you should really run it. And so I kind of jumped off a cliff in that regard. And so the first two and a half years that I was there was a much more, I mean, it was still pretty maverick, but it was um, a humanitarian organization. It was maverick in the sense that we didn't abide by any of the sort of um, strictures. I mean, it seems as though humanitarian action is as um, rigidly, structured as academia is. You know, you either do water and sanitation or you do shelter or you do children and education or something. And we were all over the map. But so that was the first two and a half years that I was there. And that's when I launched the radio station and things like that. But increasingly over that time, I came to be really convinced that, um, let me back up another second, sorry. <laughs> the other maverick aspect of what we were doing was that we didn't just... Um, there's a kind of another rule, which is that if you do humanitarian action, you can't talk about anything. You can't get involved in the political situation, whereas Kayum was really interested in us um, – taking political positions, not partisan political positions, not about who was a better person or stuff like that, but policy positions. And so that was another kind of cardinal rule that we broke. Meanwhile, I'm coming to understand that, you know, it really is the economy stupid. <laughs> not that I knew anything about the economy or economic activity or anything like that, but that's what led me eventually to decide to break, you know, once the NGO was pretty much established and up and running, I felt that um, I could leave it and start something else, which is totally economic. And it's actually not only women. It's even more rev revolutionary. It's women and men working together. And we produce, um, as you said, uh, soap, and we're moving into body oils from licit local agriculture. So my day, we live right in downtown Kandahar. I don't have the cow anymore. The cow was in the previous. Uh, we did have, you know. Omar's cow. Yes, we had Malo Omar's cow uh, in the, at, at the NGO, um, a black and ra rather wild-eyed cow whom I liked very much. But I do still have, um, I think it's Mullah Khair Allah's uh, truck. So I, I have managed to take some Taliban booty with me. You know? <laughs> so I live pretty normally, you know. I mean, we live on a side street, but right in the middle of town. No, as you said, no barbed wire, no uh, guards, nothing like that. Not that we don't have hardware, <laughs> um, but Afghans wouldn't be without it. I mean, there's just there's a question of honor that were you to be attacked, the idea that you would die without fighting is not acceptable, um, which also um, I had an interesting conversation with someone in the States who is in the whole conflict resolution world and stuff like that. She said, well, what would you do if, if you were attacked? And I said, well, I'd get on the, s on the roof and start shooting. And she thought that this was absolutely appalling. And I, my response was, well, where is it that you think that I am? <laughs> But that said, I don't feel any hostility from the town. I mean, it's not that we don't – there's a level of psychological pressure that's quite high, and all of my people, we've got 12 of us, uh, including me, in the cooperative, and people are coming to work through, you know, body parts quite often, or somebody else's – older brother is out on the front line. And so people are quite afraid of the telephone at this point. But in town, people know me. Um, I drive around. The traffic cops are friends. They come over to the car, and I give them soap sometimes. And, you know, I feel quite welcomed 
by the town. That's now. I mean, at the beginning, people must have found it quite odd to see this foreigner driving around. Well, at the very beginning, yes, because they saw it quite odd to they, – they, they found it quite odd to see any foreigners at all, you know, as you know. Um, and so the dress code was always an issue, and I, I don't kind dress of, like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I opted for the optical illusion um, version of dress, dress code, which was basically since I was going to be driving, I couldn't exactly wear a burqa, um, and so I wore men's Afghan men's clothes, not to dress in drag or to dress up as a man or disguise myself as a man, but but just so that at least from a distance I would look like what people expected me to be and they would leave me alone. And I found that I've started to do that again, but for safety reasons now, because I don't want to be a target of opportunity. In other words, you, and this has happened, someone ha is wired up and a convoy doesn't come past on the road that they're waiting on. And so they decide, well, what else could I blow up kind of thing? So in the beginning, I did provoke a lot of curiosity, and I think I still do. Um, and it can get, you know, <laughs> a little tiring. But um, now a lot of people know me. Sometimes I, I drive past, uh, this was a, a, a couple of years ago, when I was still working with schools. And a uh, little kid, da da sara, da da sara, that's Sarah, that's Sarah, she came to our school today, you know. So this sort of um, thing happens. Um, but I would say that although I attract a lot of curiosity and it can sometimes bear down on you, it's not hostile, really not. The women that are working in your cooperative, obviously during the war in Afghanistan, one of the big issues was the repression of women. Do you feel that life has improved for, for women from what you've seen, or what is the situation now? It has, but not enormously, in Kandahar. And I think that's one of the big differences between the South and other parts of the country. Um, uh, inside our cooperative, and that's something that we really try to do, is to establish a psychologically um, peaceful working environment. So there are women and men. They work together. The stages of production are inter, in, sort of, um, how to put it, um, it's like the men do the first and second stage, the women do the third. No, the women do the first stage, the men do the second and third stages, the women do the fourth, you know, this kind of thing. So each stage, is, it's like they're interleaved. They do have separate spaces. So there is a room where the women do their most of their work and a separate room where the men do most of their work, but they interact totally easily. The women are, you know, I've made it very clear if you have any concerns or anything like that, I'm here and all that. They love the guys. Fortunately, the... Women are a little bit older in general, so there's almost like a maternal filial relationship. But so that's already a big difference. The women can come out and work, but believe me, they are totally impoverished. No women would, I mean, there are basically two types of women who would work in Kandahar, either totally, totally impoverished women who are usually the heads of their households, or else a, a much smaller fringe of educated women who are getting jobs in NGOs and things like that. So I also have our administrator is, is a woman, and she's kind of from that. She's young, about 19, but she's from that fringe. But they're rare, and most of them are not Pashtun, actually. There are um, the main ethnic group in the south of Afghanistan is Pashtun. Um, there is a Persian-speaking minority which, um, again, it's surprising to Americans to hear that Iran is seen from the perspective of Afghan women to be a paradise for its um, relaxed um, treatment of women. So it turns out that the Farsi-speaking women tend to be more heavily represented in the professional positions and things like that. But my women don't tell many people that they work for us. They, um, they say they work as domestic servants and, you know, they really have to be very – nobody at this point wants to put themselves forward as um, 
being affiliated or associated with this regime. And by this regime, there's no distinction that's made between basically British soldiers, the Afghan government, and NGO workers. Those distinctions which often um, civilian humanitarians try to draw very strongly are not really experienced um, by Afghans as strongly as we you know, would assume they might be. What would you say the main complaints are of people down there? Is uh, it corruption? Corruption, or? corruption. I mean, this is the other really counterintuitive thing that I've learned being there is that Afghans are not ideological. They've been through two or three ideological revolutions in the last, um, whatever it is, 25 years, and they're vaccinated. They've had it. What they want from their government is pretty much what I want from my government, which is, you know, public services, um, uh, infrastructure, law and order. And they're not getting any of those. And they feel really that we have um, almost injected back into their body politic the most anti-democratic forces um, that they've experienced, the whole sort of corrupt warlord uh, crowd that drove Afghans to distraction in the early 1990s and made the South anyway almost turn to the Taliban with relief, you know, because anything was better than these warlords. These were the ones that we chose to be, the Americans in particular, chose to be their proxies in toppling the Taliban regime. So the result five years on is that, or almost six years on now, five and a half years on, is that the people are just disgusted with the Afghan government as they experience it on a, on a local and provincial level because it is essentially preying upon them. And so what you get is, although I don't feel that this um, Taliban resurgence, for lack of a better term, is really an insurgency. It's not an insurrection. It is enjoying some tacit complicity, but for practical reasons, you know, because people, it's almost like a protest vote in a way. It's the only way to really um, express people's disgust with the current government. So that's one thing people are really furious about. And the other thing they're really furious about, ironically, is Pakistan, because they are quite convinced, even in the South, which is um, believed often by people in the North as being pro-Pakistan, everyone is convinced that this so-called insurgency is fundamentally being orchestrated by the Pakistani government. And so, um, for example, President Karzai came down relatively recently, and he's been... People have been really fed up with him. And all he had to do was attack Pakistan on one or two radio addresses. And people say, oh, he's so great. He spoke so well. He was so courageous. You know, people loved it. And so, ironically, um, those are the two things I think that, that, that people are most upset and about. How much do you think the Taliban resurgence is because of Pakistan, or oh, and how much is it entirely, so disillusioned? Entirely. If, pa you know, if Pakistan weren't orchestrating it and running it, I don't think it would exist. That doesn't mean that there's not um, disaffection and, you know, as I said, I think there's very high disaffection with government, but it's really interesting that in the north, where there's equal disaffection, there isn't really uh, any kind of resistance but the feeling is the same. And so in the South, where the, where the feeling is disaffection, it's not ideological. It's not as though the South is, you know, some crazy fanatic area. It's the same disaffection that has an outlet because these so-called Taliban are being injected by, by the Pakistani government. And it's a, really, it's a policy that they've been following for the last... I don't know, almost 30 years now. They've, they've been instrumentalizing, the Pakistani government has been instrumentalizing religious extremism for very concrete power politics, regional power politics in Kashmir and in Afghanistan. So there's no reason, there's no logical re reason why after 9-11 they would suddenly change a policy that they've been, you know, and I, I think it's real blind, uh, sorry, to finish the sentence, policy that they've been, pursuing consistently for a quarter of a century. And I think it was real naivete on the part of the United States to believe they would. Mm. Let's talk a bit about your book, um, ah. <laughs> <laughs> which is fascinating. And you start off in a um, very 
chilling chapter with mm. the death of your friend, the chief of police, Mohammed Akram. Do you like to talk a little bit about why he was so important to you, what it was that impressed you? This was a guy who I actually had a really negative um, first interaction with. Um, when I first went into Kandahar, I decided to live with a local family. And he decided that it was illegal for foreigners to stay with locals. And I felt like saying, you know, what legal, you know, like what laws? This is Afghanistan. He shows up at this house and he was a big guy and he kind of filled the room where I was frantically on deadline trying to finish a story. And, you know, I was told, uh, Commandant Saab, he was chief of police, Commandant Saab wants to talk to you. And it was like, later, I'm busy, I have to finish. You know, it's like, Sarah, he's an important person, you have to talk to him. So he tells me, you know, you have to leave. And I said, look, I'm leaving the region anyway in a few days. Um, I'm perfectly safe here. I've got um, my five adoptive brothers and you know, they'll take care of me and this and that. So he said, okay, if you're going to leave shortly anyway, you can stay in the home. I saw him at the time as one of these warlords that I already recognized as being what was likely to cause um, the most trouble for Afghanistan as it moved forward. And he had certainly behaved like a warlord at that particular time. And the next time that I saw him also, when he tried to keep me from going up to Helmand province um, a few weeks later, when I came back to live, um, he also, uh, I don't think I put this in the, ha in the book, I can't remember, but he also sent a, a letter. I went back to the same house and he sent a letter saying, you know, you have to leave the house and this and that. Um, so I was rather, um, antag you know, felt quite antagonistic to this guy. Late in 2002, he contacted me through a mutual friend of ours. By this time, I was back working at the NGO. Um, and we had a women's discussion group, and this woman was one of the leading women uh, in Kandahar. She runs a clinic, and she was a good friend of his, and he passed a message through her that he wanted to get together with me. So I said, you know, why not? I had heard very good things about him in the meantime from other foreigners who had interacted with him. And we got together and talked practically through the night, and I found him really serious, really thoughtful, and really constructive. And he actually corroborated a lot of things that I was beginning to suspect uh, about Pakistan's involvement, about precisely the last question that you just asked. And I found, so then we started sort of meeting uh, informally, but fairly regularly, and just sharing you know, notes about what was going on, what the situation was. And I found him just um, consistently constructive consistently thinking about how to move Afghanistan forward, how to um, strengthen the central government, how to um, consolidate support behind President Karzai, how to professionalize not just his department, but the whole provincial administration. And that's all he would talk about. And I would even try to lighten the mood a little bit and get him to laugh and things. And that was all he was, he was really interested in talking about. Now, that's not to say I have been criticized for, you know, making him into a big hero and all of this. And doubtless there are things that he did do that I didn't know about and that I wouldn't be that um, pleased if I did know about. I'm not trying to say that he was a paragon of total virtue, although I found that looking back on him that, I, I mean, when he was still alive, I would often find myself making that excuse, like, you know, oh, yeah, I know, you can't really trust anybody, and, you know. Um, and looking back, I almost wish I hadn't made that excuse as often as I did, because I really, compared to every other public official I've ever met, he was head and shoulders the most um, constructive one, the most professional one. I've j and I find out things... Um, all the time because I, I've maintained contacts with his bodyguards and things like that. And I was just telling someone, um, one of his bodyguards told me a story I didn't know. He would, um, every once in a while, confiscate everyone's, all of his bodyguards' cell phones and put them on his desk. And when a cell phone would ring, he would answer it, find out who were his bodyguards talking to and what were they up to and things like that. I mean, that level of supervision of the professionalism of his staff, I haven't seen in any other um, public official. So um, he was eventually removed from his position as chief of police of Kandahar. Um, 
at the same time as the warlord governor was removed. And that was quite devastating to me because I didn't feel that they were equivalent. I felt like one was really working in favor of the central government and one was really working, was really behaving like a warlord and uh, preying upon the local population, monopolizing relationship, you know, relations with the Americans and all of the money that um, was connected with that relationship and um, also being linked to Pakistan. Whereas Akram from everything I saw, was genuinely working for a um, you know, positive future for the country. Eventually, he was appointed to Mazari Sharif, which is a town in the north of Afghanistan, which um, is inhabited by members, mostly by members of a different ethnic group, and is quite antagonistic to Kandahar. So it was kind of like throwing this guy to the lion's den, and he really did a great job. He, um, and I could even hear it in his Persian. Because when he went up there, his Persian, you know, had this very heavy Kandahar Pashtu accent, you know, it almost sounded like it was hewn out of the rocks of our mountains down there, you know. And he came back, he would address me in Persian, and I would say, you know, hello, uh, I, don't, you know, hello I don't speak it, you know. And you could see that he took to the place, he loved the place, he fell in love with the place, and the place fell in love with him, and it was a miracle. It was really amazing. If you could get, you know, a guy who represented the place that the, that the Taliban had come from, win over the town of mazar sharif it really meant something in terms of somebody who could play a role in a united Afghanistan. And I do think that he had a political future ahead of him. He was then appointed to be chief of police of Kabul in early 2005, and this was a position I had actually suggested. Now, the other thing I didn't say about my weird trajectory, which comes out in this book, is that because I worked for the president's big brother, <laughs> I had this ridiculous, preposterous access to people who mattered in the Afghan government and in actually the U.S. And occasionally there was one rotation in the British embassy where I would get these visits from the ambassador of the political affairs. You know, in Kandahar it was very interesting, you know. And so one of the contacts that I had was uh, Jalali, who was the interior minister. And when they removed uh, Akram from Kandahar, I told Jalali, you should send him to Kabul. And he laughed at me. And, then he, and I didn't speak to him for a year. And then a year later, he appointed him to Kabul. And I wrote him a note and said, <laughs> you know, so I see you've seen the light. And he was very cute in responding. But anyhow. Then he so. got sacked. <laughs> Jalali. Well, Jalali quit. He didn't get sacked. You think he got sacked? <laughs> Depends who you talk to. Yeah, that's interesting. That's uh, interesting. This is an angry book. I mean, you were very angry about his killing. Yeah. You feel he was deliberately assassinated. Who, who do you think I'm was behind it? I'm absolutely sure the ISI was behind it. I have absolutely no doubt at all. So what happened was um, he was appointed to Kabul and... Two months later, he was finally coming to Kandahar to collect his family and bring his family up to Kabul because he hadn't brought them to Mazari Sharif because he was afraid that it was a little too not very comfortable for them. And so he came down to Kandahar. Uh, I saw him the evening he arrived, and the next morning he went to a prayer service for a mullah who had been a religious uh, leader who had been assassinated three days before, and there was a bomb in the mosque, and he was killed, along with about 20 other people. And this was instantaneously labeled a suicide bombing, which now might be plausible. But at the time, it was not plausible because there hadn't been any suicide bombings in Kandahar yet. And, and there was no investigation. And I went to the mosque where this happened. In the a happened about 9.30 in the morning, and I went at 2 in the afternoon, and it was like Hariri in, in Beirut, sanitized. The place, you, I, I looked around, and it was like, where did it happen? You couldn't, there was no blood, there was no, you know, there was a pile of clothes, you know, off to one corner where it had been swept. But there was clearly no criminal investigation going to happen here. And um, to me, there was a big difference between, if, if something's a suicide bombing, then it's this sort of Al-Qaeda nebulous that, you know, members of my government love to go chasing, you know. Um, if it was... A, the, it was in the courtyard of the mosque and there was a rug placed 
over the courtyard. So you could put something under that rug. If it was a charge, a remote controlled charge placed under that rug, then you had to start thinking about who put it there, who allowed it to be put there, what were the complicities in provincial government and things like that. There was a very different political conclusion that you would draw. A suicide bomber, you know, can mix in with a crowd and it's nobody's fault really. Um, and I interviewed, I mean, my knowledge of criminal investigations is derived from law and order or something like that, watched on the television, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but at least I did know that it was important to interview people who had seen things. And interviewing bodyguards and other witnesses, I was able to kind of map out what had happened. And it was perfectly clear that this had not been a suicide bombing. The, the, the bodyguards had created a close, close protection perimeter. The explosion happened behind Akram, and it had come up from the ground. And I had three different eyewitnesses, you know, showing me, oh, you know, with a hand, through, the flash came up through the rug. So, you know, innocently and naively, I kind of brought these conclusions to everybody that I could get in touch with in Kabul, and it was the most including President Karzai. And it was the most astonishing experience because I still believe, as I guess anyone in the verbal professions, you know, journalists or whatever, I believed in the truth. I believed that the truth had power and that once it was exposed, then a whole set of results would transpire including a change policy toward Pakistan, including President Karzai removing well-known agents of the Pakistani government from inside his own provincial administration and things like that, and none of that happened. And I would talk to, you know, U.S. officials or, or military officers or whatever um, later about, you know, well, that one wasn't a suicide bombing. And, you know, I had brought things to the FBI. I had brought them to the U.S. Embassy, I, you know, and it just never went anywhere. It was really fascinating. And so I kind of um, turned to soap <laughs> as the second best way to clean up <laughs> Afghanistan. One of the things that I found really amusing in your book was when you present your eight-point plan right. to President Karzai I'm on how, how it, to get rid of warlords. I'm glad you found it amusing because I meant it to be amusing, and one American reviewer missed the joke. He didn't realize that I was making a joke on myself, which was... But, you know, I did do this with Kayum. This was back in February of 2003 when, you know, it was like, it's time to remove some of these warlord governors that, you know... Frankly, again, the Americans imposed on President Karzai, and he did try to constrain their power to some degree and was not really helped very much by Americans. So Kayum, Kayum is brilliant, but he's a little bit ethereal. I don't know how much interaction you've had with him. Have you found him to be that way also, not too practical? I think he likes making money. <laughs> There's that. Um, but he is, I mean, when he holds forth on a theory, he's qu he can be quite breathtaking. It's the pla practical application of anything that, that lags very, very far behind. So that spring, uh, or very early spring, late winter of 2003, you know, we were talking about how, what can we do about these warlords? And he comes up with this fantasy about how, you know, we're going to get provincial shuras up and running and then, you know, we'll start to create a record for how badly the warlord governors are governing and then based on that record, then people can demonstrate it. You know, it would take a decade, you know. So I said, okay, fine. So I helped him write out this whole plan. There were, two, I think, two iterations of that. I can't remember. And then I said, okay, look, let's get down to brass tacks because I really think, you know, I think the president really wants to get rid of these people. He just doesn't have quite a plan. And I had in my reporting days covered NATO and all that stuff. So I knew how sort of NATO thinks. And I said, you know, let's get this tactical. Because the other aspect of the situation then was that the – the foreigners and the Afghans seemed to be dancing around each other, that, that each one was saying, well, whatever each side was saying. The Americans, for example, would say, well, whatever President Karzai wants, you know, 
we'll do it. He's the president and we'll support him. And, and the Afghans were saying, but the Americans don't want to get rid of the warlords and whatever we do, they're not going to back us. So it, it, it was like they were dancing around each other and somebody needed to make a move. So I said to Kayum, you know, what the president really needs is a plan. So we sat down and we wrote up an eight-point plan for how to get rid of Gulag al-Shirzai. It wasn't all the warlords, but the first point was Gulag al-Shirzai at that time was the governor of Kandahar. So we had this whole eight-point plan. <laughs> it was very, um, you know, I mean, it would have worked. And in fact, it would have worked because it did work, because President Karzai did eventually remove Gulag al-Shirzai without any of the eight points in our plan. And well, nothing he happened. transferred him to Jalalabad, didn't he? So well, at that time, first, first they made him into a minister. That's right. That's right. I mean, isn't this one of the problems, that when they do remove people, they're exactly. not actually removing them. Exactly. They just put shifting them into exactly. other positions. Exactly. And so they lose, President Karzai really loses a lot of his credibility that way. If somebody is an inappropriate person to be governor of Kandahar, why is he appropriate to be governor of Jalalabad? And I think that's what people are really getting irritated with. Um, Which, I mean, far from removing the warlords, the warlords are now have further voted, entrenched voted exactly. themselves in amnesty on war crimes. But part of our point was that you could have done it, and it wouldn't have created massive civil strife or conflict or anything like that, which is what all sorts of people in power seem to think would happen. Um, and I was a bit, so the joking at myself is, you know, like, didn't President Karzai listen to our plan or something? Because, because part of the plan also included literally NATO speak, which is most likely most dangerous. That's how, that's how NATO military planning works. It's you don't do worst case, best case scenario. You go, what's the most likely scenario and how do you plan to, you know, respond to it? And what's the most dangerous scenario and how do you plan to respond to that? And I thought if President Karzai use, uses that kind of wording with U.S. generals and says, look, I want to remove so-and-so and here's what I think the most likely scenario is and here's wh how I would do it and here's the help I would need from you, here's the most dangerous scenario, blah, 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 I think that he could have actually gotten American backing for that plan. And I don't know if his spirit was already broken before that or if he never had the spirit for it or what, but as you say, all that's happened has been this kind of shell game of criminals. In the book, apart from criticizing um, President Karzai, you were, you're very critical of the Americans and the, the policy in general. Do you want to explain a bit about why you are so critical? Well, I think I've explained some of it, um, uh, but I'll just distill it back down. Two reasons. One is that we are maintaining an unshakable alliance with a country that, in my view, is um, pretty much existentially opposed to Afghanistan, which is Pakistan. So you've gotten to the point where people in Kandahar actually believe, are convinced that the Americans are allied with the Taliban because they cannot come up with any other explanation for why does a, the United States finance the Pakistani government, which in turn is fa financing the Taliban. Because they remember during the anti-Soviet resistance that the United States financed the resistance, the Afghan resistance, via Pakistan. And so they see the very same channel at work, and they can't imagine that this could just be um, either incompetence or some other global agenda. So that's one, is that, is that American policy is fundamentally at odds with itself by being supposedly anti-Taliban and anti-terror and stuff like that, and meanwhile supporting a country that has been manipulating or instrumentalizing fundamentalist terrorism for the last 25 years. That's one. And the other is, again, using these warlords as our proxies. Because we were so obsessed with catching Osama bin Laden, we didn't really care who we used. And so, and we didn't bother to learn anything about local politics. And so it ended up that we used as our proxies the very people that Afghans were delighted that the Taliban had driven. Sorry, that wasn't a grammatical sentence, but um, if there was one thing that southern Afghans were happy with the Taliban for, it was for driving these warlords and their retinues out of the country. And what did we do? Again, the cancer analogy is kind of um, one that I found useful. 
Afghanistan after the Soviet withdrawal was sort of suffering from an explosion of cancerous tumors. These warlords who were eating the body politic because they didn't have a Soviet enemy to fight anymore, and so they were fighting each other and looting the country and all of that. And the Taliban you can think of as almost like a very painful operation that at least southern Afghanistan was willing to undergo in order to uh, cut this cancer out of the body politic. And what do we do, the Americans? We take a syringe <laughs> and inject the cancer back into the Afghan body politic. And I think we're suffering from the results of that now. I'm just going to ask you one more question, then I'll open it up to the floor, because I'm sure everybody's got a lot of things they'd like to ask you. The, your project is supposed to be an alternative for people to growing poppy. How can you really... I mean, poppy you now is such a huge thing. Mm. So many people are dependent on it. Your projects and projects like that are very small, and it's not the answer. What, what do you see as the answer? Well, I one? actually do think, I don't think we are the answer, but I think we're part of the answer. I think the answer is a healthy, mixed economy in southern Afghanistan, and we would be a part of that. What we do is, um, I mean, the idea of it uh, came... Because I actually, do, I actually think magic bullet thinking is not very useful. A lot of people think, oh, what other crop could we introduce into Afghanistan to take the place of poppy? And I don't think there is a crop that could take the place of poppy. But I think that, you know, I looked around at what do people grow, and they actually grow really valuable things like pomegranates and apricots and almonds and, you know, all of that. So to me, part of the answer is expanding the access of those crops to a, a growing international market for um, natural, uh, natural products with a story, frankly. I think more and more people are beginning to realize that the I guess it's a five-pound note now. There are no more pound notes. The pound coin is a vote, is a very powerful vote. And people can choose to spend their money in ways that are going to be more beneficial or less beneficial to societies, to the environment, and things like that. And so what we do is... Um, but, but the problem with fruit is that it's heavy and perishable. And so my idea was what can I transform fruit into that is relatively less heavy and less perishable? And so came up with skincare products because there seems to be an absolutely, um, you know, bottomless market, uh, at least among the our sex. <laughs> but it's moving. Um, Neil's Yard uh, was one of my inspirations, actually. I love that stuff. And so, you know, apricot kernel oil, sweet almond oil. Um, I discovered the whole um, experience has been a kind of botanical and chemical discovery. Uh, there's wild pistachio in the Kandahar region. There's um, licorice root. There's anise seed. There's cumin seed, all of this stuff. So we press the oils and we make these soaps and stuff like that. So, no, I don't think that we by ourselves are going to solve the opium problem, but I do think that expanding the market for licit local agriculture is the way to go. And I'm shocked that people with more money than I have haven't yet, you know, for example, opened a juice factory. There, there, there's pomegranate juice on the Kandahar market. It comes from Iran. It's ridiculous. We're living in the pomegranate capital of the world, and we're importing pomegranate juice. And in the United States, anyway, there's this massive pomegranate craze because everyone's yeah, decided that, yeah, yeah Pomegranates are the, the, the secret to health and happiness, you know. And so I'm surprised, frankly, that I'm the only person that I know of so far who's really trying to capitalize on um, the image, on the tradition that Kandahar has um, or southern Afghanistan has for growing pomegranates among other fruits. And to be honest, I mean, I'm growing very slowly because of the um, situation. I mean, it's it's how to put it, you're in this bind because we're trying to um, be non, I mean like nepotism, barring nepotism. So nobody's allowed to bring a member of their family or a close friend into the cooperative, and yet we can't hire people off the street because it's Kandahar. So you have to kind of um, navigate between those two contingencies. You have to, I'm making it up as I go along, in terms of products and stuff like that. But we've got, 
we're now selling in 11 shops in the U.S. and Canada. We've got a waiting list of 70. So I actually do think that um, this as a chip in a mosaic could be the kind of thing that, that could turn the economy of southern Afghanistan around. But that would, again, take much more concerted effort on the part of international donors, one. Two, an Afghan government that doesn't obstruct economic activity, which is what it's doing right now. I mean, that's a whole other <laughs> topic we could get into. But, but I do think we should open the floor. I yeah. think that's a good idea. Right. Gentlemen there in the blue jumper. Hi there, my name is uh, Farid Littleproud. Um, my question is, given uh, how you describe the situation in Afghanistan at the moment, the warlords, um, the Taliban insurgency, lack of in, in, uh, commitment from the West in Afghanistan in terms of aid and military support and things like that, what do you think the future holds for Afghanistan? Does it, is there ever going to be any chance of, of law and order or or peace for the Afghan people, or is it always going to be this constant constant fighting that's, that seems to have gone for the last 30 years? I have to say that I don't have a particularly bright prognosis, and that's just based on what I've experienced over the last five years. I just don't see the signs um, of the kind of quite radical change that would have to come. Um, it, it's, it's not impossible. What it would take is a real commitment on the part of the West for um, good governance. Because if there were Western pressure for good governance, I actually believe um, the Afghan administration would come around. Um, but for the moment, governance has always been put on the back burner because security was more important. But to me, you don't get security without governance. If people don't feel an allegiance to a government that is actually taking care of them, then they're going to be open to other alternatives. So I haven't seen that, and I haven't seen the kind of consistency. I mean, it is so exhausting to talk to rotation after rotation of um, foreign military and civilian officials who come through and just lack the, um, the background. You know, you sort of feel like you're doing Afghanistan 101 every six months. And I'm not saying that people aren't putting a huge amount of effort and energy and money into it. It's just that um, there's no institutional memory. It's really amazing. I've watched, and that's another story that, that I try to tell in my book. I've watched, um, it, it, it's as though the foreign military and civilian presence hasn't been there for the last five and a half years. It's been there for 11 times six months. And people, there should be maps on walls that show the tribal um, distribution of different villages, for example. There should be real understanding of who major players are. And I find that I kind of have to give this lecture again and again. You know, people take away after six months and they everything that they've accumulated. I, it was brought home to me last time I was there at the changeover in NATO from the British to the American command that there are now 10 trees planted outside the NATO headquarters and that's each command that's come in and planted a tree just in the last five years. Gentlemen in the yellow. Uh, given your attempts to uh efforts to, to, to reduce corruption. How do you reconcile that with working for Karzai's brother, who's a pretty majorly crook himself? Um, I don't work for President Karzai's brother anymore. So okay. that's part of an answer to that question. This gentleman here in the grey. Uh, Mark Brain from the DART Centre for Journalism and Trauma. I, I've just got a question um, on the psychological sort of well-being or process of the people you work with. They've been through over a long period, some pretty intense trauma, uh, generational stuff. Um, and while human beings are resilient, and they wouldn't survive as well as they do on the planet if they weren't pretty resilient, how do you find people coping with just the relentlessness of what they've been through over the last 20 years? I think it's a really fantastic question and one that's not asked enough. And I think there really isn't enough attention to the psychological health of Afghans. Um, and when I started trying 
when I started engaging in the kind of active process of trying to think about for this book and in general, uh, think about the society that I was working in. As a matter of fact, I, I, I first started going down this road when um, we did our first project, which was to rebuild a village that had been destroyed in the American bombing. And the reaction of the villagers to what we were trying to do was quite perplexing to me in certain ways. And so I started thinking precisely that and thinking about post-traumatic uh, stress disorder and did quite a bit of reading into it. And um, two books in particular that I quote from um, extensively, written by an American psychologist who's worked with Vietnam veterans, and he toggles between the Iliad and the Odyssey. And, exactly. And I think he's brilliant. And um, I found those two books incredibly useful in understanding um, what I was experiencing from Afghans. Now, having these are books that basically toggle, for those of you who haven't read them, toggle back and forth between the Iliad and the Odyssey and the experience of Vet Vietnam veterans with whom he works. And what he does is basically read the Iliad and the Odyssey as books about post-traumatic stress. And the main difference, and, and Odysseus, the second one is called Odysseus in America, Combat, Trauma, and the Trials of Homecoming. And he looks at the Odyssey as a series of metaphors for the experiences that combat veterans can go through or the pitfalls that they can encounter in their effort to reintegrate into a civilian society. So after reading that one, I actually called him up. I tracked him down and called him up, and I said, look, imagine – that because one of the things that he points out is that Vietnam veterans came home individually, as did Odysseus's men, um, came home individually into a society that was fundamentally civilian. And I said, imagine a society where um, basically the combat at least a third of the society is combat veterans and that they're not disarmed. Um, and he, he has a chapter which is called Staying in Combat Mode, which he says is the first thing that combat veterans tend to do is stay in combat mode because everything that they've learned in war is much more useful in, for example, a criminal career than in being a post office employee or something like that. And so I kind of did the um, scenario. And he said, oh, my God, I see where you're going with this. And the scenario is that you were almost guaranteed to have the civil war that followed the, the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan because you've got heavily armed, traumatized combat veterans who um, are the largest proportion of society, so they stay in combat mode. So that's one. The other thing you have is the um, absolute inability of people to think into the future. And this I find very destructive to efforts to move forward now as a civilian society is that people just instinctively reason in terms of what can they get today because they're not used to having a future, you know, or, or the notion that you would, for example, as a shopkeeper, cultivate a relationship with a customer by um, not selling them a faulty, you know, <laughs> object. Uh, and getting their money right then and there for that faulty object um, just really hasn't penetrated yet. Um, and the other really per pervasive aspect is um, inability to trust, which is typical of, of post-combat uh, veterans. And so one of the things that I've really had to work very hard on in my cooperative is – building relationships of trust among the members, and that's another reason we move so slowly. But in terms of what we might um, easily identify as um, psychoses or psychological illness, you don't see it as much because, because the contrast between the traumatized people and the rest of society is not so great. And it's like the whole, it's like, it's like a collective PTSD in a way. Lady in the White, Cardigan. Hi, my name is Danielle. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering about peace journalism and what you actually think about it, whether it could actually make any difference. Peace, peace journalism? Yeah. What do you mean by it? Like reporting on, um, like, say, stories like yours, like NGOs and things like that, rather than kind of looking into warlords and things like that in Afghanistan. Well, um, I'm not sure I would make a distinction between 
piece, uh, I mean, I believe that journalism needs to be um, multidimensional. I, I guess maybe that's what you're saying. But I think warlordism and corruption and lack of governance is something that needs to be reported on. I do think that um, it would be interesting to see more careful reporting on how Reconstruction is actually being received on the ground because there's a huge disconnect between the pledges that are made in places like London or even the policies that might be enunciated by people who enunciate policies and the way projects actually look once they are um, um, completed or not completed more often. And I think that's really important. And, and I do think there's a bit of self-censorship sometimes on the part of journalists who are worried about um, donation fatigue and things like that. So, so sometimes I've experienced among um, colleagues an, a, a reluctance to uh, report on ways in which Reconstruction is not properly being carried out um, or monitored or whatever or, or ways that it's being hijacked at various different stages. And I actually think they're doing a disservice to um, recipients. I, I think there should be a way to write a story that says it's not the idea of aid in general that's wrong. It's that, you know, at this stage um, in its execution, it's going awry. And this is what needs to be focused on, not the notion of aid altogether. So I do think there, there could be room for a lot more of that. How much reconstruction is there on the ground in Kandahar? Have you seen a difference over Yeah, I mean, you do. Their roads have been paved. Um, I, uh, what I'm s a bit surprised by is the lack, well, I think infrastructure and utilities. I remember just before 9-11, actually, the UN was talking about having a rapid reaction force, a military rapid reaction force. And I thought there should be a rapid reaction force for public utilities because I had worked in other, you know, places like the Balkans and, and things like that where, you know, people were getting into issues of reconciliation and things like that while people in Sarajevo were freezing, you know, or where in Kosovo a year after the end of the war there was still no telephone system. I thought, how do you expect a country to get moving if you don't have basic utilities and things like that? And it was interesting to me because I, when I'm not in Kandahar, I live in France, and in 2000 there was a um, double hurricane in France, and it almost brought down the entire electricity grid of the, of the country. Um, I think there were either nine, 9 to 11 million households were without electricity and telephone. And, you know, the French electricity company called in, they called in people from retirement, they called in Brits, they called in Belgians, and they got the thing up in a month. And I thought if we could have that kind of a push on public utilities in post-conflict societies, we could move a lot quicker. That's one. Two, you're in a place like Afghanistan that didn't have anything to begin with. So I'm always amused at, um, as I think Kate said yesterday, that we talk about reconstruction when actually we should be talking about construction. Um, here we are talking about climate change. I live in a city where, apart from rocks, the thing you have a lot of is sunshine. I am fighting really hard to get um, funding to run my um, our factory on solar energy, and I don't see why I have to fight about it. I was arguing with people who are um, in charge of maintaining the diesel generator, the diesel backup generator for Kandahar, which is a 10 megawatt generator, and I was told, you know, by these electrical engineers that there's no such thing as solar energy for large-scale um, usage. That at best, it's just, you know, for a house, a couple of light bulbs and things like that. So I go on the web. I don't know anything about solar energy, but I go on the web, and I found, find that there's a company called Unisolar that sold a five-megawatt system to the U.S. Air Force, I think. So, you know, why wasn't Afghanistan used as a testing ground for um, renewable energy? You know, it was such a possibility. So, yes, you see some roads built, but you don't see any creativity in the expenditure of, even if it wasn't enough, it was still vast amounts of money, you know, and that's what's really depressing. And I think that what has been done is simply not worthy of, and it's certainly seen by Afghans as being not worthy of a country like the United States. It took a year and a half to start building the main road from Kandahar to Kabul.
I mean, that should have been done. That should have been started within six months. It should have been labor intensive. So you get the, all the militiamen out of their army uniforms and put on some kind of civilian conservation corps type uniforms. You get posters all over the country saying, you know, the soldiers of peace or something like that, you know, and, and get people excited about it. And I think you could have made a real difference. And, it, and it, it didn't start until people were already beginning to be disillusioned. And I just think it's a terrible wasted opportunity. Melissa Pesic, Media Diversity Institute. Um, two questions. Uh, it seems to me that you two ladies disagree a bit about the president of Afghanistan. When, and I'd like to, to actually hear more about what you think about him. Have you been too close to him not to see anymore? You don't want, or you don't want to talk about him because you said he was very ethereal when talking about you know, crucial things and the other lady said that actually he loved the money. Maybe I didn't understand. Uh, brother, the brother, of the yeah. okay. brother of the president. Okay. What do you think about president because fish stinks from above mm. as we say in Serbia. So how much he is aware of, of um, corruption and how much he is involved in corruption. One question. The second, I'm very pleased to see that another lady has written a book about Afghanistan have you, I'm sure you've read uh, the book of uh, uh, bookseller of, uh, from Kabul. Uh, what do you think about the book? Has it represented, presented Afghan family in a fair, I actually haven't read way? that. I have not read that book, um, so I can't answer that question. Um, I actually kind of declared a moratorium on reading books about Afghanistan while I was writing. And I haven't quite broken that moratorium yet. So I can't answer the second question. On the first question, I have a really hard time answering that. And I have a hard time um, because I did believe in President Karzai in the beginning. I really did believe in him. Um, and before saying anything further, I have to um, say that the Karzai family invited me into its bosom, and I don't quite know why, but on a personal level showed me a tremendous amount of generosity. And so it's a little bit hard for me to um, – th there's a certain degree of personal loyalty that makes it difficult for me, particularly in public, to um, kind of... Um, but in your book, you're, you're very critical. I mean, what's your relationship right. um, since then? Yes. Have they read it? Uh, ha, you know, I haven't... Well, let's see. I've talked to Kayum three times since the book came out and not substantively. And he always says he's busy and he needs to call me back and he hasn't called me back. So um, that's about where that is. I haven't gone to see Ahmed Wali since the summer of last year. I did see President Karzai in August. Um, so just to finish uh, this question, President Karzai, uh, there is no way that he's not aware of what's going on. There is no way that he doesn't know which members of his cabinet and provincial administration are connected with Pakistan because we've talked about it and he said that he knows. Um, there's no way that he doesn't know how on the take people are. I don't actually believe that he is personally on the take. I don't actually believe that President Karzai is raking in. Uh, I don't have a lot of evidence, but I just I actually don't think that he's particularly um, captivated by money, as opposed to Kayum and Ahmed Wali. I think some of his brothers are captivated by money. Um, and in a way, um, that's also a kind of cheap shot because he can afford not to be corrupt because the rest, if the rest of his family is, because, you know, they'll take care of him in his old age. Um, but I don't think he has particular interest in amassing wealth. On the other hand, I think that if somebody is aware that there is a gang rape happening on his watch and doesn't do anything about it, then it's his responsibility, and that's really how I feel about it. I mean, how can anybody do anything about corruption in Afghanistan if Karzai is not doing anything about his own brothers that are involved? In his... <laughs> yeah. Um... I think that his position is not quite as limp about some of his brothers as it appears to be. Uh, I would um, 
But I would talk about his entire cabinet. I mean, it's not just his brothers, it's everybody. Um, and it's a free-for-all, and he's presiding over a free-for-all. And so I've got a really hard time with that. I think that's right. And I think that you can't continue to proclaim yourself innocent if crime is happening on your watch. And so it's not enough that he is not actually taking a bribe and putting it in his pocket. That's not enough to keep somebody um, um, you know, that, that's not enough to make an honest man of somebody. And it's something that I learned myself on a very personal level because um, in Kayum's um, NGO, which where I was working at first, um, I had a deputy who was brutal and corrupt and all of these things. And I kind of saw it, but I kind of depended on him. And... Um, at first sort of felt like, well, I don't really know what's going on and I'm a foreigner and he does know and he must be right and I must be wrong and all of this. And it took me actually about two years to break out of this spell and to realize that I had empowered him in precisely the same way that the Americans had been empowering the warlords and to some degree in the way that President Karzai is empowering the corrupt people under him. And it was a real shock. It was a real comeuppance. And that's also why I sort of hesitate, because it's very easy to point fingers at people. And when you've done it yourself, because I did for two years, and fortunately I then got wise to it, apologized to the people who needed to be apologized to distance myself and, and started acting in a very different way. And that's what I haven't seen the Karzai's do. I really haven't. Um, and so... I guess there is definitely a significant degree of more distance between me and the family. Um, I, as I said, I saw President Karzai in August, and he asked me about his brother, and I told him what I thought was going on. Um, you know, I'll always do that. I'll always tell them what I actually think is happening. Um, and then I gave a talk in Washington um, at something called the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars or something like that. And I went into this whole conversation. And then President Karzai came and gave a talk at the same place two weeks later. And someone raised their hand and said, well, this lady came and talked to us two weeks ago, and she said that there's all this corruption and all these warlords in your government. He says, I know who that is. That's Sarah Chase, and she's a good friend of mine, but she's actually full of it because we've had elections and there aren't any more warlords in my government anymore. Gentlemen at the, the back. Yeah. Michael Gilligan. Uh, Sarah, do you find any of the government aid agencies of any use, like the Americans or, say, DFID or what have you, are there any of them that are more useful for helping women than others? Helping women? Um, I was actually very surprised. I had no intention of doing anything with women at all because I thought everyone is all concerned about Afghan women and I don't know anything about gender or, you know, I don't have a background in gender and um, everyone's going to be frantically doing things to help Afghan women. And, of course, nobody did. And so um, that's when I gropingly uh, in this NGO started working um, a little bit with Kandahar women. Uh, I found in the beginning it was GTZ, the German um, aid agency that was the most focused and the most usefully focused. But uh, as is often the case, it was a kind of one-year thing. Um, and so I didn't really see a lot of follow-on from what they had done. Um, it's a very delicate question because you can very easily provoke backlash, at least in the South. Um, and... So I really haven't seen, I mean, frankly, there just isn't that much private aid happening in the South at the moment. And, and so you don't really see a lot that, um, that's benefiting women, women that much or that usefully. Well, GTZ is German. Uh, DFID, I really haven't seen DFID doing much of anything in the South, um, but I'm not in Helmand, and so it may be that there, that there is more uh, activity in Helmand that I don't see. Um, USAID. Sorry. No, just because you're mentioning it, yes. this is an uh, organization which is called Mondica Mediale. They're German. Never and they, seen them. Well, they, they used to work in Musar Sharif. Yeah. Um, They're not in the South. No. Right. No. But so they, I've, I, I they haven't. used to work for women and they have, like, sort of sheltered 
houses for better women. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. USAID has been trying to integrate women into, for example, it has a large alternative livelihoods project, which I, after a year of struggling, got some money from. But interestingly, I got money as a women's program, which I'm not. Um, I'm an alternative livelihoods program. But basically, the agribusiness crowd was not interested in us. And there was a fabulous Afghan-American woman who came for a year to be, to be running the women's programs. And she said, I'm going to fund you. you know, so we were funded as a women's program. Now they're kind of moving toward, uh, rather than having separate women's programs, to actually um, encourage something like us, which, which does integrate. It's not specifically aimed at women, but integrates women into um, you know, something whose aim is, is other. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a tough one. Gentleman with his hand up there. Hi. Um, I know you're not based in Hellman, but I'd be interested to hear your opinions on the fact that we've got thousands of British troops out there at the moment and who look like they're going to be there for, for certainly the foreseeable future. And your opinions, although you, they might not be coming to di in con direct contact with you, your opinions on both their success in tackling the Taliban in the south and then the follow-on reconstruction efforts they're trying to put in place or attempting to, um, and also their attempts to, which are less well publicised, but to try and take out the opium trade as well, and whether they're going to have any success with that or whether that is, in, by its very nature, can't go in hand in hand with fighting the Taliban as well. Excellent question, that last connection. I think that, again, um, it's easy to be more um, explicitly American bashing to a non-American audience than... I, I mean, I think it's absolutely outrageous that my government refused NATO support in September uh, or October of 2001 when NATO voted a, an Article 5, you know, the first time in NATO's history this was considered an attack on a NATO member which automatically triggered uh, the support of NATO, of the NATO allies. And America said, no, 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 we don't need you, no, no, no. You know, and then five years on, when we've made a hash of things, we we then start banging on the table and saying NATO should really be providing a whole lot more help. And I think that part of that outrage is that we were not at all forthcoming as to what the real nature of the situation it was in southern Afghanistan. And I think the British military as well as the Dutch military and the Canadians came into southern Afghanistan believing and they are maybe to some degree to be blamed for not having done their homework, but more or less believing the American line that, oh, we had taken care of the major combat you know, operations and now this was a reconstruction project and everything was fine. Whereas from my perspective, having been there consist, you know, throughout the whole period, the thing had been going steadily downwards. They were, I mean, it was totally predictable that, that you, know, you would be into very heavy combat um, by last year, if not before. So on the one hand, I think it was really not very um, collegial of the Americans to turn southern Afghanistan over to uh, the British military. The British with... actually asked for it. <laughs> well, they asked for it if they were going to get anything. Did they ask for it they at that time? They specifically asked for Helmand. Yeah. There were three. They were given a choice of three. So of the three, they specifically asked for Helmand. I don't think they were given a choice of Mazari Sharif or Helmand. I don't think they were given a choice of nothing. Do you see what I mean? In other words, what I think would have been much more appropriate on the part of, of the United States would have been to bring NATO in in 2001 and, and to share the burden of the whole operation with NATO from the get-go. So then you've made a hash of everything and you tell the Brits, do you want Hillman or Erzgan or Kandahar? I mean, it's pretty much six of one, half dozen of the other. And, and since the British, you don't look convinced. <laughs> so again, it's an argument with you, but uh, the British said we want a helmet um, quite a few years back. Why they particularly, I mean, it was all to do with the drugs because they were the lead sure. nation on lead drugs. Nation and, on drug. exactly. and Helmand was the main poppy growing province. Mm. In retrospect, whether that was a, a good decision. <laughs> but do you know the context in which, because my understanding was that um, British Canada and the Dutch 
that, that the three choices were Helmand, Oruzgan, or Kandahar. It wasn't Helmand as opposed to, to Helmand province. Uh, I mean, uh, Helmand as opposed to Herat. They want to, to be in the south. And, um, the Canadians had already grabbed Kandahar. But I think because of the drug problem, they felt that Helmand was the place to be. Uh, but you see, I don't think the Canadians grabbed Kandahar as opposed to Herat. I think that the options that were open were the, the, the southern provinces. So among Kandahar, Zabal, and, and Helmand, it makes sense for the British to choose Helmand if they are concerned with drugs. Anyway, uh, uh, we'd have how, to go how back. How do you and see feel the about this? What's going to happen? And people have talked a lot about the forthcoming Taliban spring offensive. Do you see that happening? Well, yeah. I mean, let me just go back and try to finish this. I think that given this situation, and and then given a preference for Helmand, the British military went in way, way undermanned. And so what happened was something that is um, perceived by people in the South as a total ignominious uh, relinquishment of Helmand to the Taliban. And that's how it's been experienced in the South. Now, there's been a kind of counteroffensive on the part of NATO, and I think there's quite a lot of American backing for the British troops that are now engaged in an operation. But, you know, this past winter, we had our electricity held hostage by the, by the Taliban because they now basically own territory over which the hydroelectric lines pass. And it looked really dumb for the Afghan government not to be able to provide electricity without basically paying off the Taliban, which is how it was. And the Musa Kala agreement, which basically gave a district supposedly to district elders, was visible from a mile away as being essentially the surrender of a district. So unfortunately, up until now, the British record doesn't look that great as perceived by Afghans. Um, I don't think it's ne their perception is necessarily quite fair because I don't think they quite understand the, you know, they see Great Britain like America as being a very rich and powerful country with a huge army, and they don't quite understand the personnel constraints that, you know, um, might be operating under. But um, I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think there's a lot of territory to be won back by force of arms, and then the reconstruction has to move back in. Um, but with governance, and that's the real issue. Now, it was quite interesting when the British government and the Dutch government said they weren't taking over their provinces if the warlord government, governors who were in place remained in place, and that actually caused President Karzai to remove some of the most egregious um, people who were down there, not that the replacements have necessarily been a huge improvement, but um, that was an indication to me that pressure on governance will produce results. Um, so that was a very useful move, but I would like to see more British pressure on the issue of governance. As for the spring offensive, I actually don't, I don't buy it. I don't think that, I mean, if I'm a Talib commander and I know that there's going to be, that there's a huge buildup in the areas that I had just made my happy hunting ground, and I know that um, three and a half thousand American troops are staying behind, but only for three months, like, why would you throw yourself at an expanded enemy force? You wait it out. You do your offensive in the fall, or you do it next spring, or something like that. Not to say that I think it will be very quiet, completely quiet, but what I've seen is a kind of sawtoothed, progression in the level of violence. It's never been a steady, steady graph. It's been a peak and then, you know, a lull. And then the next peak is higher, and then the lull might be shorter, but there's a lull. And so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the famous spring offensive didn't happen or if it happened. There was recently an attack on another person who's in my book, which is uh, Mullah Nakib, who is a tribal elder, um, who holds sway over a very critical district immediately to the north of Kandahar. And what I think happened, back to Helmand a bit, is that I think the original tactic was to punch, we're talking back 2003, 2004, was to punch into Afghanistan from, sorry, from your direction, this way, from Pakistan through Zabal province into Uruzgan immediately north of Kandahar. And I think the idea, Kandahar is the objective. The idea was to then go straight south from Kandahar. And one U.S. commander got it 
and he tried to cut off this entry route and he tried to open up the road leading north from Kandahar through basically into Uruzgan. And what I think that um, caused was a delay in the whole offensive. And it pushed it westward into Hillmond and then as a loop into Hillmond, which is directly west of Kandahar. And then last year they were moving from Hillmond uh, eastwards into Kandahar. That area now immediately west of Kandahar is saturated with NATO and Afghan army um, folks at the moment because everyone's getting ready for the spring offensive and everyone assumes that it's going to happen in the same place as it happened last year. Mullah Naqib owns the little district that is immediately north of Kandahar, which is a much better place to fight from, actually, because it has a better tree cover. Um, it's called Argandab. And he was almost killed about a week ago on his way from Kandahar to his home in Argandab district. And to me, what that said was that they are going to try to go back to plan A. And if they had killed him, they probably could have done it this year. Not killing him, it could produce a backlash because his tribe is not particularly pro-Taliban in spite of its um, disinformation to the contrary, and they're going to be hopping mad at this attack. I think we've got time just for one last question, lady. Thanks. Uh, knowing President Karzai as you do, sorry, Catherine Davis, um, knowing President Karzai as you do, why do you think he's been so reluctant to take the kinds of action that you've talked about this evening, whether in dealing with corruption, good governance issues? Is it because he um, is waiting for perhaps directives from the Americans, as some would claim, or does he fear that he won't get the international support he thinks he needs if he takes that action? And if that is the case, why is it so? Why does he have that perception? Uh, I think that is largely the case. I think that um, I think that he is not a very confrontative or strong person temperamentally. I do think that initially in his presidency, he intended to curb the power of um, these warlord types. For example, one of the stories I tell in this book is how he had actually appointed this Mullah Naqib to be governor of Kandahar. And Gulag al-Shirzai um, basically took the, the, the province by force. Um, and there was a meeting at which President Karzai was going to basically settle this problem. And the Americans were, were all sitting on Gulag al-Shirzai's side of the table. And so President Karzai kind of read that body language. And there were a couple of more instances. I mean, there was a time in 2003 when he actually was about to fire six of these guys. And the Americans all filed through his office and said, no, you can't do this right now. It's, it's too destabilizing and we're, you know, in Iraq and we can't back you up. Now, this is where I think that he could have done a little bit of more, more, um, most likely most dangerous planning and maybe assuaged. In other words, I think it's a combination of the Americans aren't really behind him, but he's too weak to bring them behind him. In other words, if he had stood up and said, look, it's my country. I need to do this to carry my country into the future. Here's how I'm going to do it. Here's the help I need from you guys, and I'm going to do it whether you like it or not. The Americans would have been forced to fall into line behind him, and he just doesn't have that kind of strength of character to do it. I think that's the main problem, and I feel that he's just wilted since then. He's not even trying. So he's almost overreading the response of the Americans. Um, I also think that he um, has a relatively shrewd understanding of the perfidy of American friendship. I mean, we're not, we don't have a very good track record in terms of supporting people that we royal up, you know, and Pakistan remains on his border, and we may or may not remain. And I do think that he's hedging his bets. And I think it's a terrible tragedy that he's hedging his bets, but that's what I think he's doing. Sorry, would it be a stalemate? 
Yes, I think it would be a stalemate until there's a different president, and I can't guarantee that a different president would be any better. In other words, I can be very explicitly and strongly critical of President Karzai, but I now have enough experience in Af Afghanistan to know that when I'm absolutely sure that somebody's terrible and ought to go, guaranteed somebody worse shows up in his place. And so I've become a little bit more hesitant. Um, than in the past. But I don't think you'll see a, a, a major change in policy. I just, every time there's an opportunity, on whatever level, um, I haven't seen him perform in ways, unless he's forced into it, in ways that indicate that he's turning back around on this issue. Thank you. Um, I'm sure Sarah will be happy to sign books <laughs> afterwards. It's a great book. And thank, thank you. you very much. I'm sure everybody would like to join me in thanking Sarah. Thank you.